Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you are doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today we are revisiting Fortune and Glory, the cliffhanger game. This is a game that I've been wanting to get back to the table for some time, and I am super glad that I did. I took a little poll over on the Dungeon Dive uh, Patreon and asked people which game they want me to uh, revisit uh, in the order that they would like me to revisit the games. And this one won. So after this, we're going to revisit uh, Bloodborne. And then I'm also going to revisit uh, Iron Helm with all the expansions. But this is a game that I've been wanting to revisit just to make sure that I like that I liked it as much as I thought I did. And after playing it for some time, I think I like it more than I remember. Uh, in my recent top 50, I put this at, I think it was like number 29 or number 30, somewhere around there. And um, I think maybe I should have um, rated it higher. I think I might actually like Fortune and Glory more than Shadows of Brimstone. Uh, Shadows of Brimstone has more to it. It is a bigger game. It is a more traditional dungeon crawl. It is one of the like biggest dungeon crawls with the most stuff and a ton of fun. But it can also be really hard to get to the table because it just takes up so much space and it takes a lot of time to get things set up, a lot of time to get things going, and a little more time to get to where you're feeling comfortable with your character and the adventure, you have to put a little more effort into Shadows of Brimstone to progress it to where it's like a really good sweet spot of fun. And I don't feel that with Fortune and Glory because Fortune and Glory, it's, it's just it's just a board game. It's a one and done board game. You set it up, you play a game and you have all the fun in a single setting or a single sitting, I should say. And that kind of fits my style of gaming now more than it used to. And so that is something that I really appreciate. And um, this recent play of Fortune and Glory that I'm doing now has really elevated the game to, in, in my estimation. So let's talk about uh, five things that I really enjoy about Fortune and Glory. Number one is just the sheer kind of audacity, the boldness of the adventure in this game. I mean, this is a game in which you are just going out and fighting Nazis. Uh, killing Nazis is always a good thing. And this uh, game just says, hey, you know what? You are going to be fighting Nazis and you are going to be beating them down. And I love that. Uh, the, the, the There's all kinds of ways that this game is bold in it, the way it presents itself. So in this game, I am playing as Sharon Hunter, a daring photographer and Grant Jackson, Grant Jackson, a soldier of fortune. And we are playing the co-op mode. I'm playing two investigators or two heroes. I can't remember what the, what the heroes are actually called in, the, in this game. Uh, but we are going up against the Order of the Crimson Hand. Of course, the, uh, the, the cult in all of the uh, Flying Frog Productions games. I love fighting against the Order of the Crimson Hand. I love that they have this this cult entity that is uh, consistent in many of their games. I think that is super cool. And another way that this game is super bold is that my uh, character, Sharon Hunter, the daring photographer, she starts with uh, an ally as one of her uh, cards that she starts the game with. So I drew an ally at random and I drew the president. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? My character, Sharon Hunter, the daring photographer, is allied with the president. And the president allows you to instantly defeat an enemy. So at one time, at one time, I used the president's ability, and I was fighting this group of like very deadly Nazis. And I was like, as Sharon Hunter, you know, calling up the president, uh, Mr. President, please, uh, please call in an airstrike on this group of Nazis over here. And um, and the president was like, he obliged, and he did, and I beat the Nazis, and all because of the help of the president. What other game gives you that kind of, of, of ability? I just think that is so much fun, so cool, just so bold and adventurous. Um, another thing that I like about the game is how the tension hits from the very first turn. So a lot of times in these kind of um, big co-op games that have a threat management system where you are trying to put out five 
uh, five fires with three buckets of water. The tension builds a little slow and you usually have a few turns to kind of like get your bearings and, and, and make, you know, um, build up your, your characters a little bit. But that's really not the case in Fortune and Glory because uh, the game has you going to try to find these, these items, these um, artifacts, and the artifacts are going to give you uh, fortune and you need a certain amount of fortune to win the game. And you want to get a certain amount of fortune before the enemies get a certain amount of fortune. And so you are competing with them for these artifacts. And uh, th in the co-op game, the main villains, a certain number of them, one if you're playing with, with, with two heroes, starts on the board already at, at a location with an artifact, already working towards getting that artifact. So from the very first turn, that tug of war of the victory condition is already in play. And you have to make crucial decisions from the very first turn of, okay, are we going to try to stop the villain from getting the artifact that they're already on? Or are we going to, to go and, and adventure somewhere else and hope we can get lucky with another artifact? And I really do like that. And that kind of leads into my point number three is that... Uh, that helps keep the length of the solo game down. I think I remember, I, I can't remember if I complained about the length of this game. In my top 50, I did complain about the length of a lot of the games that I do enjoy because that is a common thing that a lot of these kinds of games that we like to play on the Dungeon Dive, a lot of times they are just too long for what they are. And I was, uh, I was, Kind of struck by the realization during this play that the solo game for fortune and glory really isn't that long i mean you're looking at probably you know about an hour and a half uh, especially if you know the rules i always have to like relearn the game and so that does take a little bit more time but the game is is really snappy especially in that co-op solo mode where i mean because of that because of, of that the tension from the first turn because there's that tug of war starts from the very first turn, uh, the games are actually pretty quick. Um, I, after I learned the game, I was about halfway through this game in about 45 minutes, I think. And uh, that's really cool for a big epic experience. And this game does take up quite a bit of table space. You know, my table, my gaming table is small. So I have things uh, set up here and I do have this uh, TV tray set up for uh, the some of the auxiliary stuff over there, all of my uh, tokens and, and, and instructions, and of course the uh, handy dandy uh, flow charts. I mean, look at this flow chart. You know you're in for a good time when a game has a flow chart that complex, right? <laughs> but yeah, once you learn the game and once you get it set up, it's really not a super long solo game, especially for the adventure that it offers. And that brings me to number four, all of the adventure. I mean, there is just so many cool things that you can do in this game while you are globe trotting. You're going from city to city. If you have the expansion, you can have random encounters at the docks. You can have random encounters in the city from this like huge city deck. If you have an uneventful day in the city, if you have the expansion, you can have one of these major city events and these epic events that happen in the city. There's all kinds of gear to draw. Uh, there are a huge stack of event cards that are like positive things. These cards that you can get to spend later to do all kinds of cool things. You have a stack of, um, of villain events and these villain events will uh, cause interesting things to happen. Uh, just halfway through the game so far, I have experienced a cargo plane mishap, a boat chase, and infilt I infiltrated a mob gala. Uh, I had a rendezvous at a nightclub. I went through a maze of caves. I infiltrated a shadowy castle and solved an ancient puzzle. And yeah, a lot of these are just pictures with the tiniest little bit of flavor text, but these are all narrative dots. And when coupled with all of the other decks of cards and when coupled with this huge board and all of these different icons and all these different places you can explore, these narrative dots, if you let your imagination go, they just create for all kinds of interesting situations. And the serendipity, which is number five, the serendipity that arises from all of these random elements in this game is always something that is fun. For instance, over here in New York, 
I drew an uh, an adventure or some kind of event that led to it was a city card, and there's an auction at New York. So I can take my uh, discovered artifacts and I can go to New York and I can auction them off for the chance to uh, win a little bit more money. However, uh, soon after that, this villain event that I drew, which was super cool, I love that photo there, was a wealth of evil. And this is a while this uh this says while this card is in play anytime a hero sells an artifact in a major city roll a d6 on the roll of a one or two the artifact is secretly purchased by the villains and they gain it as though they had collected it themselves i just love the connection between these two cards because in new york city there is some kind of auction and uh the whole point of the cult of the order of the crimson hand is like they have these uh they have these henchmen, they have these cult members who are working all around, and any ally that you have has a better chance of being a member of this cult. Well, of course, the cult would send somebody undercover to this auction to try to buy the artifacts that you are selling. I absolutely love that. It's just, it's a perfect kind of um, serendipitous narrative moment that these two totally random things that got drawn when combined together, create a really interesting, fun, and engaging story. So those were five things that I really do enjoy about Fortune and Glory, and five of the reasons why I think I should rate this much, much higher. Uh, perhaps this should be in my top 10, and Shadows of Brimstone should be taken out. Um, I don't know. We'll see if I ever, uh, when I, you know, in a couple years, when I revisit my top 50, uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I do think there is there is some 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 complaints I have, and 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 one is just all of the rules. Uh, this game has so many rules. Uh, once again, this is the flowchart for your adventure phase for one phase of, of a turn. Um, it is a very very fiddly game. There are all kinds of things I often forget. One of the things I always forget is all of these special. Uh, attributes that the villains get as they collect artifacts. Um, I'm, I'm always forgetting to trigger those. There are exceptions to exceptions to exceptions. I This is one of those games where I don't know if I've ever uh, played even a single turn 100%, 100% correctly. There is so much to remember. And again, I think that is one of the reasons why I do prefer to play this just as a solo game, because then it doesn't really matter. All that really matters is that I am having fun. And if I forget some of the rules sometimes, well, then, hey, that's how the cookie crumbles. And one other tiny, tiny little nitpick I have about this game is the use of fortune and glory. I just think the roles should be reversed. OK, in the game, you have these gold coins, which in any other game, gold coins would be your currency. But in this game, the gold coins are your victory condition and the blue coins are your currency. They should just flip flop these. I always forget which is which. You know, this is fortune. This is glory. Glory you spend, but fortune is your victory. I think it should be the opposite. That's just a very small nitpick about a fantastic game. I guess another criticism would be just if you don't like luck, uh, you would want to avoid this game like a plague because this is what you're doing a lot in this game. Yes, you are rolling a lot of D6s. You are hoping for high rolls and you are hoping to avoid low rolls. Luckily, there are quite a few ways to mitigate that luck, but you are rolling a lot of dice in this game and you are drawing a lot of random cards from random decks, rolling on random tables. And so if, if you if you don't like games where a lot where a lot of your where your victory is often determined by luck, you will probably want to avoid this game. For me, that is a positive. So I would put that in the positive in a positive slash negative, just depending on the kind of game player you are. But yeah, I am so glad that I am revisiting this game right now. It has been a ton of fun getting back to the table. I've super enjoyed this adventure. And I am looking forward to playing this game a lot more in the future. I think I, I need I need to rotate this game into my uh, you know, onto my table more frequently than I do. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed taking a uh, revisiting uh, Fortune and Glory, the cliffhanger game from Flying Frog Productions. We will talk to you later. Bye bye.